faculty and academics <laughs> at Forum. So Nora and I are standing close together because I am using her mic. So I'm also using my teacher voice, so I hope to um, project as well. But I want to welcome you all and also welcome our friends who are tuning in online for this. Um, I love sunflowers. <laughs> you know, whether I see them on the side of a road or at the farmer's market on a Saturday morning, all those bright sunny sunflowers. Or when I think about the memories of my grandfather who used to dry the sunflower seeds for his grandchildren. They just always make me smile to see them. So I'm very interested in this talk titled The Diversity of Wisconsin Sunflowers by Dr. Laura <laughs> Mitchell, who we are so lucky to have as an assistant professor in the biology department here. Now, a couple of things before I turn things over to Dr. Mitchell. There is a fire drill scheduled at 1245 today, so we will probably have to just cut the discussion a little bit short, but we are gonna go until that alarm goes off. So those of you online, when you start to hear that annoying noise, that's what's happening, a scheduled <laughs> fire drill today, and we do have to evacuate the building. Um, if you have questions, remote viewers, you are very welcome to email them to orsp at uwc.edu. That's orsp at uwc.edu. And our um, graduate assistant, Max Clark, will be happy to, to read them to our presenter. I'm gonna ask Dr. Mitchell if you could also repeat questions that the audience gives yes. for our online viewers that will just make sure that everybody can participate. And so enough of me, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, thank you, for yes. that. thank you for that lovely introduction. Again, I'm Dr. Nora Mitchell, um, and thanks for coming here today. So a little bit about me, I am Dr. Nora Mitchell. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biology here at UW-Eau Claire. I'm currently a fourth year professor here. Apart from my job, I am a runner, teacher, and I am also an ultimate Frisbee player and coach of the team here on campus. So a little bit about where we're going to go for today's talk. Part one will focus on sunflowers as a model system. We have a preconceived notion of what a sunflower is and should look like, but there's actually a lot of diversity in sunflowers. So I'll talk a little bit about why they're a good model system for studying both ecological and evolutionary questions. We'll then dive into some research that I've been doing here at UW-Eau Claire with some amazing research students. For part two, we'll ask how sunflower traits vary across space at multiple scales. And then in part three, we'll ask whether or not there's evidence for hybridization in the sunflowers of Wisconsin. Let's dive right into part one, looking at sunflowers as a model system. Sunflowers are um, sensu stricti, or in the most strict sense, are any species in the genus Helianthus. The term Helianthus literally means a sunflower, coming from the Greek, and they also have an Ojibwe name. Sunflowers are very prevalent in pop culture throughout the centuries. For instance, Van Gogh painted sunflowers, as did Georgia O'Keeffe, and more recently, they've been immortalized through Emojipedia in the modern era. <laughs> So we often have these Western concepts of sunflowers. Sunflowers are actually native to the uh, Western Hemisphere. So they have uh, roots in both North America and in Central America and have been used for multiple different in multiple different indigenous cultures as well. Here in the Midwest or even here in Eau Claire, you may know them through some of the beautiful cultivated sunflower fields that we have on the south side of town. For instance, Babette's Seeds of Hope has a incredible field as a dedication um, to this woman pictured here. And yes, my students and I have pilgrimage to that site to take some photos as well. So that's the genus Helianthus and a little bit about why people are connected to them, I think. More broadly, sunflowers are in the, family, the plant family called Asteraceae. The Asteraceae is arguably the largest plant family in the world with approximately 33,000 different species. In addition to having helianthus or sunflowers, they have a ton of other species that we use for horticultural and agricultural purposes. So just to name a few, like all of these are also in the sunflower family. I will not go over all 33,000 species, but you can imagine tons and tons of diversity in this group of plants. 
And so part of my interest is asking why some plant groups have so much diversity, both in terms of the number of species as well as their morphologies, or what they look like. If we look at this genus Helianthus a little bit more closely, they have a really fascinating, what we call inflorescence architecture. So this structure here, what looks like a single flower, is actually several hundred flowers kind of bunched together in one unit called an inflorescence. So in the sunflower head, in the middle we have what are called disc florets. These are tiny little flowers that will eventually be able to produce seeds if they've been pollinated properly. So those are in the middle. What we typically think of as the yellow petals are actually completely separate flowers. These are called ray florets. They are sterile and therefore cannot produce seeds, but function to help to attract pollinators. These disc florets are the ones doing all the work for reproduction, therefore. If we zoom in onto these disc, disc florets, they go through multiple stages. They're arranged in a spiral pattern, um, so they've got some cool mathematical geometry to them as well. For these, we have different stages. We have unopened flowers, male flower, flowers in male phase, and flowers in female phase. So if you look here, we have an unopened disc floret with five tiny little petals that are all closed up. After a little bit, that flower will open up and be in the male, what's called the male phase, where there's pollen presented on it. And then eventually, that same floret will go into female phase. Here you can see a disc floret in female phase with these feathery little stigmas here upon which the pollen will become attached to. And then if we get pollen tube growth, we can have the production of seeds. <clears throat> So this overall structure is really fascinating and also does have a good deal of diversity, not only in the family, but also in the genus. Sunflowers themselves have about 70 different taxa within them and display lots of morpho morphological diversity in terms of their inflorescence architecture, pictured here, as well as in their growth form and leaf traits and overall kind of morphology. Again, there are about 70 different species and their center of diversity is in North America. Looking at this heat map, we can look at the species richness for sunflowers, and we see strong centers of diversity in the eastern into midwestern, south central United States. Sunflowers are also really important in supporting pollinators, too. So they support really diverse pollinators, looking at Dr. Clancy's Neff in the audience. Um, in one study alone, 87 different bee species only were found on Helianthus in one study. So those are only the bee species, not to mention all the other insects and pollinators. If you're out there in the field enough, you will encounter all sorts of insects on there. And I once even saw a hummingbird try to visit a sunflower, which was pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. Sunflowers are not only important for natural systems, but they also are a domesticated crop. So when talking about why I study sunflowers, in addition to my natural passion for their diversity, I have to sometimes talk about their economic importance too. So here's a photo taken by Norm Elstrand. Here's a wild sunflower growing right next to a field of cultivated sunflowers. And they do differ in many marked ways. Uh, I tweeted this picture once, and I was talking about the difference between the akines, or the fruits, of domesticated versus wild sunflowers. Sharpie for scale. It's a universal scale as a Sharpie, or a banana. Um, here is the uh, domesticated sunflower seed. And folks, when I've tweeted this picture, were like, but where's the, where's the wild one? It's right there. It's very small. And my students know counting these, sorting through them, requires a lot of patience and skill, um, and just looking through a microscope as well. So the cultivated history of sunflowers goes back probably about 4,000 years ago. Our best estimate is that sunflowers were first domesticated somewhere in eastern North America although some analyses also point to domestication history in Central America. It's very plausible that sunflowers have been domesticated multiple times throughout North America, North and Central America. So fast forward about 4,000 years to uh, data from a couple of years ago, sunflowers are worth a good amount of money in the United States economy. Not as much as soybeans or corn, of course, but they are major contributors. These are data from 2019, um, looking at some of the states that they're grown in as crops for either their seeds or often for their oils as well as an oil seed crop. Wisconsin is not on this top eight list. Minnesota is nearby. Um, but overall, in 2019 at least, 
Sunflowers are valued at nearly $370 million, and uh, about 2.5 billion pounds of sunflower product were produced in that year. So they do contribute to the economy in many ways. So justifying sunflowers, again, incredible diversity, important for our natural ecosystems, really fascinating morphology, and the money aspect, of course. Okay. So let's move on to some of the work that I've been doing here at UW-Eau Claire with some of our students, asking how sunflower traits vary across space. This work was funded by UW-Eau Claire through the OR Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, who's also hosting this talk, as well as a grant that I was awarded through the Milwaukee Public Museum. Thanks to all the students and also my funding sources and um, fellow biology faculty mentors for this support. So for this work, we decided to look at three different species that are found in Wisconsin. Those include the giant sunflower, Helianthus giganteus, the sawtooth sunflower, Helianthus crosus serratus, and Maximilian sunflower, Helianthus maximiliani. All of these are wild species. Um, they are also perennial species. So whereas the cultivated sunflower is an annual species and has to be replanted every year, these will grow back from um, underground rootstocks or underground tubers, depending on the species. They're also all pretty widely spread throughout North America. So looking at the distribution maps, data from Bien, which has not been ground truth, but overall, very broad distributions of each of these species. The giant sunflower, Sawtooth sunflower and Maximilian sunflower all have fairly broad distributions and all occur in Wisconsin. So it's interesting to think about the different environmental pressures, for instance, in Texas versus Wisconsin. Um, but again, here we're focusing on some local slash regional study systems. When I think about plant traits, a trait really is anything you can almost measure. So the, it's almost a meaningless term. I talked about this in some interviews I had about what even is a trait. But often the traits that I look at are indicative of how plants function. In, in particular, I'm interested in these trade-offs in fast versus slow lifestyles. So for instance, we have this one trait called specific leaf area, abbreviated SLA, specific leaf area. SLA is calculated as the area of the leaf divided by the dry mass of a leaf. So how much area there is per unit of actual stuff in there. So not including the water content of the leaf. When we think about fast plants, fast plants are those that employ kind of a live fast, die young strategy. They often have these thin, floppy leaves, which have a high SLA in this case. So a high SLA is often associated with a live fast, die young lifestyle. Example here is an annual sunflower. Slow plants, on the other hand, often have, a tough, have tough and leathery leaves with low SLA values. Their strategy might be slow and steady wins the race, for example. And pictured here I have Welwichia. This is a plant that grows. It's a very extreme example, for sure. But it's a plant that grows in the Namibian desert. Its leaves are very tough. And these plants can live for like, there's one that's estimated to be 1,500 years old and has two leaves and is about this size. Um, it might be about five or six feet tall, but again, for that age, not a ton of biomass there. So we can look at this in terms of SLA, and just to give you a visual of what SLA looks like, because it's kind of an abstract idea, um, again, fast plants with high SLA tend to have kind of thin leaves or a lot of area per given mass, so maybe thin, floppy leaves whereas low SLA plants will have a lot of leaf matter. So they might have a lot of um, biomass in those leaves, a lot of secondary compounds as well. Not only can we think about the fast versus slow lifestyles of these plants, we also have predictions about how SLA in particular should vary across the environment. So for example, um, if we have temperature going from cold to hot, or rainfall going from dry to wet on the x-axis, and SLA on the y-axis, we were at slow, low values, and fast, high values, we can set expectations. And these expectations come not only from first principles about how plants work, but also from global analyses. So at a global scale, at least, we would expect a negative relationship between SLA and temperature. So hotter temperatures associated with slower strategies, like the Namibian desert, colder uh, temperatures associated with faster strategies. When it comes to rainfall, we then we expect a positive relationship, where we have fast lifestyles where there's lots of water in wet areas where water is plentiful, 
and slow lifestyles where there might be less water. So what we can think about that on a global scale, but if we focus on a single evolutionary lineage or even closely related species within a genus and within the same region, like we're doing here, then we can in some ways control for evolutionary history. And we can also limit to some extent the amount of environmental variation because going from dry desert to wet rainforest may or may not be the same as going from dry Wisconsin to wet Wisconsin, which has much less variation overall than the global scale. And so some of this research was led by two of my students who have now graduated, Tu Nguyen and Michael Bylander, who are both at the University of Minnesota currently in a molecular and cell biology program and also in dental school. So a reminder to students that you can work on plants and then go into medical fields or something else. Oops, sorry about that. So in the summer of 2020, we had this funding to go out and collect data on these plant species. Here we sampled five to seven populations per species of our three focal plants. So here's a map of where we looked. We did sneak up into Duluth, Minnesota as well. Um, and field work is really amazing. And I was fortunate to, with COVID restrictions, be able to do outdoor field work, which felt more safe. And so we got to explore Wisconsin, a lot of roadside ditches. These plants are kind of, you know, people might call them trash plants. I think they're amazing, but they're found a lot in roadside ditches. so They're pretty easy to find. And also when you take the biology bus, which is meant for 15 people and stick just five people in it, there's room to space out. We had lots of adventures on this bus sampling these plants in various areas. And so we had some nice pristine or restored prairies, more roadsides. We even had one next to a uh, human built dam or just kind of in these random uh, nature reserves as well. So our first question was, how do these sunflower traits vary across space? Just trying to establish that. We're using SLA as our example here. So here we can look at box plots of the values of SLA for different populations colored according to species. So what we see here is substantial variation often within a population, between populations in the same species, and also variation between different species or among species. So Giganteus tended to have higher SLAs, Grossa serratus and Maximilianae lower SLAs. But what we're really interested in was also how these related to the environment. So we went and downloaded data um, from called these bioclim variables where we can get annual temperature and annual precipitation values as well. As a reminder, this was our expectation when it came to SLA and temperature. We expected a negative relationship. When we went out and actually looked at that, we'll have lines for all three different species. And we found overall through our um, general, linear, general linear modeling results that there was a significant relationship between SLA and temperature, and it was negative just as we expected. So all th the three species sometimes inhabit different parts of the environmental space in Wisconsin, but consistently had a negative relationship when we tested them. And this relationship was statistically meaningful. We also had predictions about SLA and precipitation, where we expected this positive relationship here. We looked at our specific um, plants and precipitation, what do we find? Nice straight flat lines. So essentially no relationships between SLA and, and precipitation, at least in the populations that we looked at, which may or may not be interesting. I personally think it's interesting when uh, patterns at a global scale cannot be replicated at um, smaller scales, either evolutionarily or geographically. We also collected data on soil. So there are some soil layers that we can download from the internet. And then later we went to actually sample soil and have them process for specific um, nutrients. And so if we do an analysis on soil where we do this principal components analysis, where lower values indicate sandier soil, higher values indicate more clay-like soil, we also found a positive relationship here. So it's possible that we have um, faster growth strategies in areas with more clay-like soil compared to sand-like soil, at least in our region. So this, again, was statistically meaningful. So if we look across these wild populations, we can get at some observational measures of how these plants are varying. But we cannot attribute directly these patterns. They could be due to phenotypic plasticity, or they could be due to genetic differences or some combination of the two. But we can also look at sunflower traits at a different scale in a more controlled setting. And this is some work that we've been doing the last several years, the last three summers. And this research in particular was undertaken by Alex Leonardson and Lydia McNabb, 
we established what are called common gardens with the same uh, overall populations of sunflower seeds at two locations in Eau Claire on the north side of town. These are called the Jeffers site and the Cornell site. These are located just a couple miles apart, but also feel drastically different. Backing up this common garden approach, we essentially got some wild source seeds, germinated them all in the greenhouse, all by myself in 2020, and then we planted them out in these common gardens. So thanks to Dr. Boyning for um, tilling them, their field sites with her tractor. So we go out and we have these two sites where we plant 225 individuals per site, 75 per species, um, and go out and can then keep track of every individual plant in an overall common setting with the replicates. So we have our Cornell site and our Jeffers site pictured here. And you know, digging holes really does build character. So we dug 450 holes for this study. Um, I will say I've dug more holes in Texas than I have in Wisconsin, but you know, there's still time. Okay. So here we're asking, or here my students were asking, these two were asking how these traits vary across space on a much smaller spatial scale, just between two common gardens, which are located pretty close together. And additionally, we're not, there's less genetic variation because they at least come from the same seed source populations. So for each species then, we'll have box plots of what SLA looks like at Cornell and Jeffers. And what do we find? Overall, very consistent pattern across species that the Jeffers site had higher SLA than the Cornell site. Again, these are two-ish miles apart as the crow flies, a little bit further as I drive. Um, so we do see very significant differences in specific leaf area. But evolutionarily, the thing we're often really interested in is fitness, AKA reproductive output. So from a single season, we can also look at the reproductive output estimated as the number of seeds or number of fruits produced per plant. Again, looking at with box plots between our two common gardens. And we also consistently see that Jeffers plants had overall higher fitness than the ones grown at Cornell. So connecting the dots now, how do SLA and fitness correlate together? Well, at, within each site, we see generally negative relationships between the two. So at Cornell and at Jeffers, higher SLAs, so faster strategies, are associated with lower fitness, actually, which is an interesting pattern that we have here. Again, because these are, just, these are so close together, we don't expect, for instance, differences in mean annual temperature at this scale, since they're very close together. But they did differ a lot in terms of some of their soil components, soil nutrients especially when it comes to our various measures of phosphorus. So it could be that we're having, at this scale, differences associated with microhabitat or with soil nutrient content. And the two sites do feel very different. As we've continued to monitor these plants, they continue to diverge in terms of what they look like and how tall they are um, and the traits as well. So in conclusion from this part, we found overall faster trait values in cooler areas in our study of wild populations. These trait values were not associated with rainfall, at least at this scale. We did find slower trait values associated with higher fitness in our common gardens. And all of this could be related to soil type in our wild populations, maybe phosphorus in our common gardens. In a follow-up study that Michael Bylander did in the wild populations where he actually sampled the soil nutrients, he actually did not find a significant relationship with phosphorus. So soil type may be more of a factor than nutrients, at least at that scale. So that's a little bit about how these vary across space. My next question was asking if there's evidence for hybridization in Wisconsin sunflowers, because sunflowers are also a model system for studying hybridization. In a classic example by Lauren Riesberg and uh, all of his collaborators, all of my um, postdoctoral relatives, these two species of sunflower that are widely distributed, Helianthus annuus and Pediolaris, have crossed together multiple times. So hybridization in this case is when two different species are capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. Depending on where they cross, they formed three entirely new species. Those include Helianthus, Helianthus paradoxus, Anomalous, and Desertocola. What's really interesting is that Annuus is kind of a roadside sunflower, Pediolaris, very similar. They like disturbed habitats. And these three species inhabit really extreme habitats either in deserts or salt marshes, which are nothing like their parental habitats. So in this case, hybridization may be generating diversity. For my postdoctoral work in Texas, I looked at a different sunflower um, hybridization system. 
using experimental approach. So here in Texas, we looked at annuus and another species, Devilus, and generated control and hybrid lines, Ge monitored these through eight generations and planted them in a couple of final common gardens after eight generations and found overall, you know, this is just background info, that we had increased fitness throughout generational time in hybrids, while the controls were not evolving in terms of fitness. So hybrids were evolving and controls were not, at least in this system. Um, but that was Texas. Texas is different from Wisconsin in more than one way. Um, so I was interested in whether or not there was evidence for hybridization in the Wisconsin sunflowers. And so I went back to some of the older literature. Um, so R.W. Long, back in 1960, wrote this paper where we talked about the related species having this perplexing tendency to fade into one another. Really artful language here. So he focuses on other states plus Wisconsin and focuses on some of my um, focal species as well. So there is some evidence, at least through crossing experiments and this historic, semi-historical <coughs> literature of hybridization here in Wisconsin. And in fact, when we went out and sampled our unique species, we also found one population that looked morphologically intermediate as a potential hybrid. And so those hybrids, I, it's really hard to take photos of these sunflowers because there's always a ton of background vegetation as well, but had this intermediate morphology that we found really interesting. And so in order to look at hybridization in uh, a molecular scale, we had to do some additional work. So from all of our wild populations, we collected leaves for DNA extraction from 10 to 20 individuals per population. So um, students extracted the DNA in the lab, and we sent it to be sequenced um, through next generation sequencing at the UW-Madison facility. And then we used DNA in multiple ways to assess genetic relatedness. If you're interested in the bioinformatics pipelines or anything like that, we can talk about that later. I just want to jump into some of the results because I'm running low on time. So these are what are called structure plots here. In each of these, I have the morphological species or hybrid demarcated. And then each vertical bar that I will show you looks at the genetic ancestry of an individual. So each bar is an individual. It's genetic ancestry colored by the number of values I give it. So I might tell it that there are two different genetic groups then it will give colors to every individual based on whether or not they belong to group one or group two. I can then say that there are three groups and they'll color them by that, four groups, and so on and so forth. And so when we look at this, if I tell the program to only have two genetic groups, they come out like this, where Giganteus is separate from Grossus serratus and Maximiliani. Um, and when you see two colors in one vertical bar, that's potential indication of hybridization in the past. So this hybrid here is about 50-50. If I tell the program that there were actually three genetic groups, it then comes up with their species, Giganteus, Grasso serratus, and Maximiliani, all in one color. The hybrid has ancestry from all three. If I tell it that there's four groups, Grasso serratus tends to get broken up into multiple populations. And so the best grouping for this one was actually three, so all of our three species. And the hybrid seems to be a mix of probably Maximiliani and Giganteus, potentially with some Grasso serratus. There's also some indication of uh, mixed ancestry throughout, but not strongly so. We can also look at this in um, principal components space based on our DNA markers. And this is based on about 7,000 some DNA markers. And so in this space, points that are closer together are more similar genetically. And I've also colored them by the species that we identified them as in the field. So what do we find? Well, Grasso serratus, we're more similar to each other, Giganteus, Maximiliani, and these hybrids, these individuals, again, there are only a couple of them, are intermediate between Maximiliani and Giganteus. Um, so that's our hybrid right there, which is in line with some of our results from structure. We can look at this in a different way um, using what's called a splits tree diagram to look at the evolutionary relationships between them. So splits tree, um, very briefly, we tend to think of evolutionary relationships as being bifurcating. So one lineage becomes two lineages. But if there's hybridization, we might get horizontal gene flow in multiple ways. And so any point where we have these boxes is an indication of potential introgression or movement of alleles between or genes between species in the past. And so we do see some of that. And again, our hybrid is uh, may be associated with hybridization and is falling intermediate between Maximiliani and Giganteus. So for this part, we find very little evidence in natural populations for at least rampant hybridization. There may be some historical hybridization going on, 
and now there are some potential isolated events happening. Um, but it does not appear to be widespread throughout the genome, although we are looking into that further at the moment. So those, um, so I use sunflowers as a way to answer lots of questions in terms of both ecology and evolution. And I think they're not only really interesting and valuable, but they provide excellent resources for students to become involved in research as well in a way that feels familiar and they can learn new things about them. And I think there's so much that we can learn from sunflowers overall, and I'm excited to continue a lot of this work in the future. So with that, I'll thank uh, UW-Eau Claire, ORSP, Vicki Lloyd Larson, and the McNair Program for um, funding, the Milwaukee Public Museum Run Blood Fellowship, the Wisconsin DNR for permits, and all of our local uh, landowners as well, and all my undergraduate collaborators. A number of them are working on additional projects, looking at hybridization across the whole Asteraceae family, working on poplars, working on white clovers. But again, I only had 35 minutes for this talk, so I tried to trim it down a little bit. It's only 74 slides for a 35 minute talk. That's like <laughs> not that bad for me. So with that, thank you for joining, and I will take any questions. Bob. All right, so that value of surface area for mass, is it SLA? Mm -hmm. All right, so what's the SLA change for, I was thinking of buy-in. Maybe they have a live fast, grow young first year, and then more of a slow and steady second year. Is that a thing in biennials? Yeah, so the question is whether or not biennial plants, I'm sorry, I'm repeating for the, the yeah. audience. The question is whether or not biennial plants, which grow for two years, tend to have different values of SLA. I don't know for sure, actually. I think they would, um, but SLA can vary for a number of reasons. So, for instance, even throughout a growing season, SLA might change throughout that season. And so when we measure SLA, we try to measure at the same time. So it can change developmentally. It will change in sun versus shade leaves. So if you grow a plant in a very sunny area versus shaded, it will change SLA. And we've used that a lot. Actually, if you grow tobacco leaves, they'll often shade them to take advantage of that phenotypic plasticity to have a more um, pleasing product for smoking, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, I would imagine they would, but I don't know any studies that directly look at that at, off the top of my head. Okay. But good question. Nick, Dr. Wheeler, do you have a question? Nick? <laughs> <laughs> so you showed that those other, you experimentally hybridized those two species of sunflowers and you showed that the hybrid had increased their mass, mm -hmm. which is most hybrid wrong, right? Um, but then, this, assuming that what you did find was a hybrid in Wisconsin, right. and that there were many more back in 1940 or 60 or whatever, can you speculate on Right. So I think one thing about 1960 is that we didn't have these molecular tools. So people and naturalists would go out and would look at something and be like, that's a hybrid, that's a hybrid. And they'd name them and they'd do these things with them. And so we can't, there may be some morphological intermediacy that people thought were hybrids that aren't actually. Um, these are also perennial plants. Um, so I think there may be some differences. There are known differences in plant groups about the rates of hybridization between perennials and annuals overall. Um, the system we looked at in Texas, we chose that system because there is a natural hybrid that was hypothesized to have the backgrounds of those two species in particular. So in some ways we were trying to replay the clock of evolution in terms of what we thought happened in the past. Turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that because it's always more complicated than that. Um, but that's, so we were picked one that we thought was successful and to see if we could kind of recapitulate that in a controlled setting. Um, for those ones also, they were in common gardens. They were allowed to evolve naturally, but were in kind of a confined space. So in terms of like their dispersal ability and ability to establish in new places, we weren't looking at that in particular. So Great. Is, uh, is yeah, so the fitness, I, sorry, can you pre repeat the question? So, uh, yeah, the, the traits that you measure that are part of fitness, you don't know that to be Yes. But there are many more traits that have to do with fitness that you can measure. Right. And that estimate of fitness comes from harvesting seed heads, counting the number of seeds, and then um, 
extrapolating that to the number of flowers that the overall plant produced, because most of these will produce, some of them produce like 40, 50 plus different flower heads, and then each of those might have several hundred seeds, and so we get an estimate of that. We don't individually count all thousands of them per plant. But so that's an estimate of actual reproductive output looking over generational time when grown in a common environment, which we did at two sites in Austin and Houston. When you plant a common garden in Austin, Houston, you do it in March. When you do it here, it's June. <laughs> so. I have one more question. Okay. Yeah. How do you measure uh, dry? You put it in the dry oven for at least 48 hours, and then you weigh it again. <laughs> cook it. Very low temperature cook, though. You don't want to overdo it, because then it'll burn. But yep. So. Thing, you know, we take a leaf, it's very simple measures, so that's why it's good with working with students. Um, not that they're not capable of more difficult things, but when you have high volume, it's easy to do. Get a leaf, weigh it, scan it, get the area, an image J, dry it out, weigh it again. Yep. Yeah. Is it possible to have two generations, I'm thinking of Texas. Yeah. Is it possible to have two generations of sunflowers within one calendar year? You would mentioned about oh. the number of generations. So the question was whether or not you can, sorry, I forgot to repeat some of the questions. The question is whether or not you can have multiple generations of sunflower within one year. Not in a natural setting, at least. I think, like, experimentally, you may be able to do it. Depends on the species and if you can grow them at a rate where they will actually reproduce. Um, what's nice about sunflowers is kind of the opposite, is that if you store their seeds properly, they will last for over a decade if you keep them nice and dry and cool. Um, so that's what we did. In terms, I don't know of anyone that's done multiple generations within a year, but in the right greenhouse or growth chamber settings, it may be possible, um, but not, again, in like a natural field setting where they're depending upon seasonality. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Klein, just now. You chose the trait SLA. Yes. What would be another trait? So we did measure other traits. I just didn't present on them. We did leaf dry matter content and leaf succulents. We also looked at chlorophyll content, leaf. Um, and these are all kind of these simple, easy to measure traits. What like we might consider like type A traits. Um, I would love to measure more physiological measurements, but those are more time consuming and often more money. I know we have some of those resources, but looking at maximum photosynthetic rate or some model conductance, those things take a lot longer. We are looking at some model traits in our poplar studies because they're easy to measure. Students were interested in some model traits in sunflowers, and we tried to use our typical measure of getting them, and it was not working. The, they were very, the leaves were a little bit too hairy to do our typical measure with. When we removed the hairs, it was um, not working well. We could definitely look at somata if we took, like, Sample leaves, clear them and stain them, but that's a whole other process that's a little bit more time intensive, so we'll need a really invested student to investigate that question with this many plants. Yes? I need to ask about your um, Eau Claire site. Mm -hmm. So it seems like, and I want to make sure I've got it right here, the Shepherd site, that there was greater variability in the results than yeah. the Cornell site. Do you have any explanation? So the question is about what the amount of variability in the two common gardens and how there is more variability at the Jeffers sites. It could be due to microenvironmental differences. The, so I want to, sorry, I forgot to mention, both sites are owned by Excel Energy, and they have graciously allowed us to use some of their land um, without, with no cost. So acknowledging that, um, the Jeffers site does have more variation in terms of what's going on around the garden. Around the garden, there's a road that's close by, there's like power lines, there's invasive plants, so it could be that there's more environmental heterogeneity within the site. Okay, thanks everyone, we gotta bounce.